welcome to the Imposter Syndrome Club and Woman Jekka. Um, my name is Jessamy G. I'm joined by my beautiful co-host, Miss Alice Edie. Hello, Jess. Hello, my love. I'm, so, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I just love hearing you say that. I get really excited. Oh. I'm like, oh, cool. What's happening? <laughs> <laughs> we have We're a here. podcast, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> it does feel, it feels like forever since I've seen you. But um, just before we we jump right on into it, um, we, we say Woman Jekka as part of our welcome here at the Imposter Syndrome Club because we record on Wurundjeri land here in Nam or Melbourne. Um, and Woman Jekka in Woiwurrung language, um, which is the language of the Wurundjeri people, literally translates to uh, to come with purpose. And um, so that's what we like to keep in mind here in our lives and podcasts. Sometimes our purpose is just to be silly billy fucking idiots. That's and a- sometimes it's to solve the world's problems. <laughs> it can be both. <laughs> and they're both, both. both they're both valid. <laughs> they are both valid. But the most important one is for us to uh, hang out on purpose, yeah. which is uh, I've been missing. You might hear from my voice. I am getting over a pretty gross uh, sickness, which was the gift that uh, India gave me on my way home. Thank you, India. <laughs> <laughs> it's the opposite. Uh, it's not in I'm my the demons. opposite of Alanis Morissette. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you, India. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's man. not India's fault. It's not India's fault. It's international travel's fault and just I've bodies a- being blobs in spaces. Yeah. Fault. I have to say though, it's I had a really, really funny moment in the car on my way from my hotel to the airport leaving India because I like I was sick and I just come off the back of like a massive, ridiculous month or so. And anyway, I won't get into all of it, but I've not, I've not been well, I've not been mentally or physically well for the last few weeks, but the feeling of like getting sick and like almost stepping outside of my body and watching myself be, be angry at India. (laughs) Like it was a like, like I'm so raw and vulnerable that I'm taking things so personally that I was like pissed at a whole country (laughs) (laughs) that had done nothing wrong. (laughs) But that was the overwhelming feeling and it made me laugh out loud because I'm like, this is so ridiculous. (laughs) Like this is not an all right person, a person who is angry at India. It's so, (laughs) it's so good. And I know we've spoken about it, but it's just, it's that thing of, you know, you are in, I always think of the petrol gauge in my car and the red lights at the bottom, like the fuel yeah. you're running on fumes. And it is like, that is your body's version of the red petrol light has come on oh, yeah. when just the world being the world feels personal. Like yeah. it's a personal attack and it's just like, yeah, you feel it because I think we're all just animals. And especially when you're a sick animal, it's you hurt and it sucks. Yeah. But yeah. To be able to take yeah. two steps back and be like, mm, yep, okay. <laughs> That's not <laughs> maybe. <laughs> she's not doing doing great. One of our um one of our listeners um sent us a message about this this exact thing, which I thought was so funny. And she was saying she uh could tell that she was like right at the bottom of her, yeah, her her petrol light was flashing because she stubbed her toe and then yelled out her husband's name. <laughs> <laughs> so his name was Tim, was like, stubbed her toe, was like, oh, Tim. And he's like, I have nothing to do with this. And she's like, oh, yeah, that's not great. Oh, my God. I, love, I mean, at least he was in the room. At least he was in the room at the time. Like, I've definitely. <coughs> I apologise in advance for the coughing that's going to happen it's through okay. this episode. It adds, um, it adds a, a layer of gritty, uh, edgy realness. <laughs> It's just bringing some validation to my story. Yeah, you're like, it's like when you <laughs> you phone your client, you like have to cancel, take a sick day off work. Hey, I just I can't come into, uh, <coughs> oh my God, I'm sorry. That's just the rule. I mean, I'm saying this as someone who's pretty much never had a job, but I, <laughs> but, but I do understand from what I hear, it doesn't matter how sick you are. It's like the second your boss answers the phone, it'll just clear up. Your sinuses will immediately clear (laughs) just for that phone call. I just want something, just just anything, a milliliter of phlegm to lend credibility to the story. (laughs) No. (laughs) Um, 
Anyway, what were we talking about? Yelling at people, <laughs> blaming other people for stubbing our toes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, That I just thought that was such a funny example of that thing where you're like, oh, I am not in my right mind yeah. at the moment. Like I'm just looking for something yeah. else to blame, be it your husband who had nothing to do with it or a country. <laughs> <laughs> I do think it's a thing I notice myself doing because I know that I do that. Like if I get if I hit my head on something, stub my toe on something, slam something on some part of my body, my brain will immediately find it's like a radar. It sends out a radar signal for the closest human being. It doesn't yeah. even, it could be someone in the house, someone in the next room. Like it doesn't matter who they are, but just the closest line, straight line to another person. As it is definitely their fault. Yeah. And then I have to talk myself down. I'm like, no, it really fucking isn't. Like you left your shit on the floor and then you tripped on your own shit. And this is not like anyone else's fault. But because I know that I do it, I notice that I'm also very sensitive to other people doing it. So the second someone around me gets hurt, I just go very quiet and like back away. <laughs> I'm like, I'm just going to let you do your processing. Because if you swoop in there too quickly, it's like, I'm like, I know I'll be the bad guy. You know what's so interesting is there must be, so obviously this is very common, right? I mean, I mean, <laughs> at least it's common between you and me and some of our listeners. A hundred percent of our, um, of our study group of three yeah, yeah. experiences. <laughs> exactly. <coughs> but there must also, like, I think in our, the context we're talking about, it's kind of, I mean, it's still annoying when you're in the moment and obviously like a marker of something else, you know, going on and not being at your best, but it's quite funny, right? And it only takes like a millisecond to be like, well, obviously it is not yeah. this person's fault. But I'm sure there must be like a whole contingent of people walking around the world that feel that but don't have the follow-up thing yeah. of like, but that's not true. A hundred. I think there are so, and like not only people, I think it's one of those incredibly common and very toxic relationship dynamics where I think mm. there's just a lot of, and I'm speaking like I'm outside of it. I'm not, I've definitely participated in that. Like there are many times I've caught myself doing it, but there are equal amount of times where I, I have continued to believe it was someone else's fault for yeah. whatever period of time. But I think that there are a lot of people that just exist in this dance of continually blaming. And then that person becomes, they just become your like default it's like flypaper that just all your shit sticks to that thing because yeah. they're just the closest thing you can blame. And what it does as well is it like it disempowers you because if you think that everything else is someone else's fault, then yeah. you have no power to change things yeah. ever. And I imagine that would be um, horrible. Like that would not be a fun yeah. way to to live having had some a small amount of recent insight <laughs> into the situation of everything being an inanimate object country or other human uh, beings fault. Um, it's that it does feel really powerless and that wouldn't be a fun way to exist. Yeah. I think it's one of those short term fixes that creates like a bigger long term problem. Yes. In the same way that needing that hit to like, Okay, so a different example, but like say everyone has days where they feel self-doubt or some insecurity. That doesn't mean you need to be a chronically insecure person, but it's just a human feeling that surfaces yeah. once every so often. And they're kind of, I feel like there's the path then sort of splits in front of you. And the one of those two things is at some point you have to interrogate those feelings, self-regulate, get like manage yourself back to yourself mm. or given that you're feeling a bit insecure you sort of like again look for the closest person to you either physically or emotionally and like seek a little hit of validation and of course I'm, I'm now making those like two separate things there's a time and a place for everything mm. but I think that there's often a danger where like when it's always starts being easier to find it in a partner or find it externally that little and, and it's so, it's like the short term, it's the same as like the blame thing. Like yeah. in the moment, it takes the shitty feeling away from you. Mm. But over a long period of time, you, you're just disempowering yourself. It's like a slow erosion and you're just getting less and less empowered. You're needing that always from like an external place. Mm. It's not, the end of that road's not a great place to be. Yeah. 
It's interesting. I've been thinking about the sort of idea of external validation quite a lot recently, <laughs> having just like totally fucked myself essentially by doing too many things. But like in a way, like I know that we've, we've spoken heaps about, you know, burnout and taking on too many things and, you know, having um, your energy be too disparate over multiple projects. But I feel like it's it's mostly been theoretical for me up until this point. Like not that I've not felt burnt out before or exhausted, but like this is a whole different level of situation where I'm like, yeah. oh, this has made me very unwell. And I'm like, well, why, why? I mean, some of it's just bad luck in the sense that like a whole lot of things just happened to happen at the same time. It wasn't designed that yeah. way. Like both work things, life things, travel things just kind of all ended up falling on top of each other. So like in, in the space of one week, I ran a marathon, did two graphic recording jobs, hosted Creative Mornings Melbourne, which is our first sold out show, did our live podcast and flew to India. That's yeah. too many things in a week. P- put on top of that, this is literally a week after I had a fucking like nervous breakdown. Yeah. It's like, it's not, it's not cool. Like, and not in a like, I don't know, as, it, as I'm saying, it's like, not that I hadn't believed this stuff before, but it's like it did feel quite theoretical in the sense that like, yeah, but like not me. Yeah. Or, or and I'll be okay. <laughs> like the, my inability to take my own advice is the most fucking frustrating thing <laughs> in the world. <laughs> but it just feels like, no, but like I should be able to tough it out. There's um there's a line in Alice in Wonderland um, where she's where she says I give myself very good advice but I very rarely listen. And it's just, That's it. <laughs> there it is. That's right? it. Which makes it ten times more mm-hmm. annoying because again, back to the previous point, there is no one to blame. Yeah. In, but like, but I do. I hear your point with the theoretical. Then the rubber hits the road. I do think though that that is why it's important to have those conversations when the time when you don't need them. It's it's kind totally. of like yeah. someone was saying about meditation the other day, which by the way I still don't do. But <laughs> <laughs> but, but guys, you should meditate though for real. Um, <laughs> what they were saying was, it's it's like often what people do is like they'll think about it, think about it, wait till they get really fucking stressed. And then they're yeah. like, Jesus Christ, oh my God, I need to do something. I'm going to sit down and meditate for 10 minutes. And then yeah. I, yeah, that is, that will help. I mean, that'll be better than not having done that. But you do, the whole point is like you build up the fitness when yeah. you don't need it and when times are good. And I think hopefully your ability, even in the car in India, to be in the middle of the shit storm, but still at least have the perspective of, of like the awareness of, what is happening yeah is is due to the fact that this is a thing you've like thought about a lot before you've needed to uh, absolutely I, I I couldn't agree more it's just interesting to see like like oh no this is it, it's almost acknowledging not acknowledging like realizing that I thought I believed it before but it was probably more lip service than I knew it yeah. was like I, it's not that I didn't believe it at the time I was like oh I didn't realize it was like Real, <laughs> like really real though. Um, uh, fuck, what was it? Oh, yeah, with the, the meditation thing. I think that's, I've been thinking about that too. Because again, it's just, it's a thing that I, I reckon the longest I've ever lasted is maybe a few weeks. I know how good it is for you. But when you are like in the midst of the thing, for me to like sit down and be with my own thoughts for 10 minutes is actually not a great thing for me at the moment because I'm just having like arguments with imaginary opponents. Yeah. Um, you lose 100% of those, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> if you were wondering. Um, but I think of it's sort of like if you've got a um, an injury, like I had a, a, an ongoing shoulder injury that was really annoying. And so I kept being given these um, um, what do you call it? Like recovery, uh, rehab, rehab. Thank you. Exercises to do, but they would make it worse because it was inflamed. So I couldn't, the rehab, I like I needed mm. to fix the inflammation first before I could go and do the rehab exercises. Cause the rehab exercises were actually making it worse in that moment. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, like that's that's cool. Like those things are great, but you need to fix the like emergency yes. situation first before you can work on the thing that's going to stop it from happening again. That's a really, I love that example because it is kind of also just shows the nuance between like a cure or the idea of like something can be good for you, but that's not just how to say this, that doesn't just exist in a vacuum. Like that's always contextual. And it's yeah. like, just because the, it's it's kind of another example of that is like this idea of healthy, a thing is healthy or not. Mm. And you're like, that is a non-concept. Mm. Healthy can only exist in relation to other things. And it's like, sometimes the healthiest thing you can do is go out for a beautiful dinner with your friends because in the context, you know, if someone's life, if someone's felt incredibly isolated and sad, the healthiest thing they can do is, go see friends instead of going to gym that yeah. day. Yeah, yeah, or, totally. or the opposite, if they've only been socializing, the healthiest thing could be for them to go to a yoga class alone. Like none of these things exist and and your rehab for your shoulder is not objectively good or bad, but it's it's the wrong thing before you've given the shoulder time to actually just rest. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And it's hard when, <laughs> if you're, when you're the one that has to make that decision, yeah. Because it's like, well, is this true or is this because like I just want to go to the pub instead of to yeah, the gym? I know. I know. Is- <laughs> that's the <laughs> that's where the heart and that I guess, you know, that all comes back to sort of, you know, self-awareness and yeah. knowing and knowing yourself and your patterns. Which is not, I mean, still, it's not easy. The yeah. like the amount of shit that I'm able to rationalize to myself is incredible. Yeah. Just because it's what I want <laughs> to do, not because it's actually the good thing. I think that this is, it's that thing around that's, it's always amazing to me, our capacity to tell stories and how it's like the fundamental thing that is to me, what is so amazing about hu- being human is we make meaning from things that are inherently meaningless. Yeah. Which is like this almost godlike superpower. It's it's fucking magic. Like a bunch of things are floating around the universe, but then we string them together and are like, this matters because of this, this matters because of this, and this is special and this is beautiful. But then we've like got this huge power, but also often lack that final last 5% of awareness of like yeah. quite how fucking powerful that is. And if you let that machinery run unchecked, unaware, it is the most dangerous thing in the world. You can make exactly the same base material. You know, I've seen I've seen this with with friends. I used to share a studio with an incredibly talented person who was who was very insecure and very depressed. And and they would tell stories of their childhood and sort of and and I kind of tell you, tell me why they were where they were, which was all true and, and completely valid. But like I just remember thinking, I'm like, you've you've cherry picked. 10 incidents, which I can hear you rerun a million times. Like I can hear how well-worn these paths are, these reasons for you being this adult with these issues. I mean, what about the other 10 billion possible moments in there that you could have like picked apart and then woven together slightly different to be like, yes, I was bullied the whole way through school. And that's why I did all this work and now um, make such a point of being really kind to my friends and and what you can make it fucking mean whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah. It is tough though because obviously, you know, we have inherently like a a negativity bias as humans because it's, you know, in terms of like cavemen and running from lions, it's much more useful to have a bias towards negativity and like they're expecting something to go wrong. But in like inner city Melbourne, <laughs> working as an artist in modern life, it's um, not as useful. So I guess that's the, the, it seems easy to go like, yeah, we could have like reframed this in all of these sorts of ways, but it's, you know, it's easy to say, yeah, isn't I know. it? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I know. Yeah. And, and but also I agree, but it's yeah, that it's fine just line that easy. of delusion as well, which yes. I guess is like, yes, but if you just continually rewrite the story of the world to suit you, that's also just being, yeah, unhinged and disconnected. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, can I tell you another yes. ridiculous yes. thought I saw myself have while I was away? 
I'm so it's happy. Just I'm the me human. observing my own dumb brain, going, "Who is this idiot?" I feel like it's like the mini Jessamy that's riding the, <laughs> the roller coaster that's inside this Jessamy's body right now. You're just like, "Wow!" And yeah. another another loop to loop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look at her go! I love it. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so I had like a. I was I was basically in and in and out for work, right? So I didn't have a lot of time outside of the days I was actually working there. Um and the the area that I was in was just sort of like business parks within business parks. So there wasn't like there wasn't anything to see, like there wasn't even a shop really that I could go to and get stuff. Um and the traffic there is so intense, like like much worse than I've seen anywhere else in the world. I think because it's grown super quickly, like a lot of big companies are outsourcing to that area. So like there's a massive like ANZ building there, for example, Cisco, whatever. Which which city? Bangalore. Okay. Um, So yeah, anyway, all, all this to say is that like the participants, so I could walk luckily from the hotel to the office, which took me about 35 minutes. So that was like the, my outside time, just trying not to get run over. Um, but they were like 10 Ks away and it took them an hour and 45 minutes in the car just because the traffic is like standstill. So um, anyway, all this to say that the small amount of time that I did have the day that I was leaving, like my flight was at like 6 PM or something. I was like, well, I could try to like go out and see something, but it felt really like nerve wracking because it's like the world of traffic, it could take me 45 minutes or three hours. Like yeah. I don't want to feel like I'm stuck somewhere. Especially when you've got a flight hanging, <coughs> sort of hanging over your yeah. head to be, yeah. And I was so desperate to get <laughs> home as well. Like yeah. I was miserable. I was getting sick. Like I just wanted, yeah. like if something had fucked up with the flight, like I would, that would have been it. Yeah. I'd be like, I'm out. <laughs> See you later. Um, but it was funny. I was like watching myself feel like that the, the should of like, you're here, you should go and see something. So talking to like other people that I was working with over there, who'd been there a lot, or even locals, the only things that seemed to be within like a reasonably short drive, um, were a palace and the market. Now, I don't give a shit about the palace. I just don't. And I hate markets. It's like a walking <laughs> panic attack to me. And I feel like I know that you're meant to care, but I don't I don't care. Like, I know that the the reality of me going there would have just been me, and because I'm on my own as well, me yeah. going there feeling incredibly overwhelmed and uncomfortable, wanting to go straight back and then like that's that's Ta- it. Taking some kind of obligatory photos to prove that you did the thing. Spot on. Yeah. Exactly. So I was going through this thought process. I'm like, what is, what is the actual reason I would want to do this? And the only reason I could come up with was, was thinking I'm, it's going to feel really embarrassing to me when I get home and people go, how is India? Oh, did you manage to get out and see anything? And I'll be like, nah. And they're like, I didn't have time. I'll be like, nah, I just didn't want to. Like, you know what I mean? Like the, (laughs) there was something that felt so shameful about, not doing the thing, but the reality of the situation would have been that I I hated it. So like, why? And no one else actually cares. Also, yeah. Firstly, no one cares. Also, secondly, I think it's oh, oh, just so many things. Like firstly, yeah, no one fucking cares. You get to do whatever you want yeah. or whatever you don't want. Like you get to not do. But um, But also recognizing that like a day is not a day in terms of it's not just like every – one day is not just automatically equal to another day. So for example, if you've been on holiday for two weeks and you've got one more day before you leave and there's something to see, that day will feel really different to you if you've compared to if you've just spent a week working 10 hour days in a conference venue, like you've had your fucking business brain on. Now you've got one day before a long flight home, like you're exhausted, you're tired, you're getting sick that you can't compare. It's not like for like, it's not like, oh, well you had a day, this is, the expectation for how you should use those eight hours. It's like, that's true. It's your energy. It's how you're feeling. You're fucking tired. Okay, cool. There's the world is full of palaces. You're never going to see. 
Yeah. <laughs> That's just one of many. <laughs> I love it. The world is full of palaces you're never going to see. <laughs> it sounds really profound. I mean, I, I should make fridge magnets. <laughs> I'd buy them. <laughs> so deep. Yeah. It's but just, it just, yeah. yeah. It's a funny thing as well. Like even if I had, if I wasn't sick, if I did have energy, it was, but I just decided that I didn't want to, that's also okay. Like yeah. just like, why, why am I again having these like imaginary, not arguments, but putting myself in these imaginary yeah. future scenarios where people are angry or disappointed with me. There's actually an exam. No one cares. As you arrive at Melbourne at Tullamarine <laughs> Airport, there's an exam that measures how cultured you are. <laughs> It's like, what did you see on the second step on the way up to the tomb for the princess and what year was it built in and (laughs) why the fuck don't you know? Something that I was going to see, and this is like a very, I think that this, what I'm about to say is either the reason people hate me or love me, but this (laughs) this is my hot take on that. All right. So your brain, right, which is the seat of all of your experiences, Mm -hmm. Jessamine, Mm -hmm. it's floating around in the dark inside your skull. And it just gets electricity in. It gets like information that comes through your ears, comes through your eyes, comes through your nose. Like, and that goes into your brain and your brain makes the world that you think you live in. Yeah. So your brain will never see that palace anyway. It's like locked in the dark in your skull. You'll see, like, it's just electricity and it's just, it's like the experience. So quite honestly, I'm like, you can have a fucking revelation in your bathroom you can have it at a palace. You can yeah. have it on the flight. You can have it in a conversation with a taxi cab. Like obviously putting in different sensory things makes that inner environment more interesting and it makes connections. And that's ultimately like, for me, the value of those experiences is like yeah. if they change you, but if it's not going to change, if, if, if you can be adult and honest enough to be like, I am in, I'm not in the place to be changed by this. Yeah who the fuck cares, you know? And I remember this like amazing experience I had in like a fast food place in Atlanta. I think it was, I was on a, I was on a transfer from Bermuda to Atlanta, Atlanta, I think to London down to Johannesburg again. It was like a crazy long flight and I'd done the Bermuda leg and then there was an airport strike. So there was like 24 hours in Atlanta before leaving. And I was coming off the back of a long trip. I was exhausted I was alone and now had this 24 hours. I also had no money. So I was like, I can't fucking take a taxi (laughs) and go see, I'm sure, whatever Atlanta has to offer. And it ended up being the most amazing 24 hours. Like, firstly, the hotel I was, they'd put us up in, which was also incredibly depressing and is a place I would never have chosen to be. And I would never go back to it. It was like in those like office industrial parks, kind of what you're saying. It's like faceless, nameless, like only... I think those airports only exist for like corporate travel and airports doing exactly that, like putting transfer people in. Um, But it also was hosting this like children's beauty pageant. Oh, yeah. My fucking God. Dude, I like saw it and I was like, this story is just turned around. (laughs) My eyes lit up. I have struck gold. I was like, I didn't even have to. I went downstairs. I like arrive and kind of just like notice what, you know how you notice something slowly? Like, one small like child bride <laughs> walks past. They were like probably four or five. They were tiny. <laughs> walks past and I was going like, that's weird. And you're so tired that you don't really clock it. And then like five minutes later, another one walks out. You're like, wait a second. What's <laughs> you're suddenly like around, there's just hundreds of them. And I ended up going to my room, like left stuff in my room, went downstairs. And it was on the whole lower floor of the hotel where their kind of like conference facilities were. And I felt like I was in one of those documentaries where it was like, like toddlers and tiaras kind of thing. And it was like full on American pageantry in this like small, but also like not big enough to even be like a big one, just kind of like small scale, like like regionals. I don't know. I don't know. It was so- The fact that it was being held at the like airport hotel is probably giving us the information (laughs) that we require. It was wild. And I remember just being like, I want to take photos, but I was also like, I am here alone. I'm like an adult alone. I do not have a child here. Yeah. Like, I cannot be taking photographs of this. Like, like correct. It's, yeah. It feels weird already. <laughs> but it was just like surreal and crazy and and like so weird and cool. And then afterwards, I was like, okay, cool. I, I don't want to go into the city. I kind of just don't have that energy feeling bad. And I went, walked across the car park and it was just such an American 
fast food kind of place, which sounds like such a quote unquote, like bad traveler thing to do. Right. But also I was like, I am in America. Yeah. That's a cultural experience. And also it was just so, I don't know. I was like, I haven't, this is like the kind of thing I see in movies. Like we don't have this in South Africa. Like it was so, I was just like, it was a shithole, but it was great. And they had like one of those like salad valleys. That's like really, you're like, this is fucking questionable. There's (laughs) all these like buffet things of olives that have probably been there for like three weeks. Like, but it was great. And I just like, Made the salad, drank coffee, sat in the corner, drew some shit, just hung out alone and just spent like a day kind of like staring at a vacant car park. It was amazing. That does sound amazing. It was great. It was so good. I'm like, that's that can be a palace too. Um, well, but this is the thing. This is what I was just thinking. Like, it's weird that we decide that some things are cultural experiences and some are not when you are in like whatever is happening in that place is the culture of that place. Yeah. So like the like learning how how to walk next to the traffic on my walk to and from the office every day and seeing where people, you know, stop to have their ciggy breaks and what the sort of like unspoken rules are in terms of like when you go and exactly. when cars go and that is also a cultural That's experience. That's also Bangalore. Bangalore is not just a palace. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that's the then the same thing like, you know, a crappy American diner and toddlers and tiaras in your hotel is also a part of American yeah. culture. <laughs> it's the world. But we decide that some of these things are like our cultural yeah. experiences and some are not, which is quite odd really, yeah. isn't it? And you, I mean, one could argue, I guess it's more like, historical rather than cultural maybe but like in terms of experiencing what a place is like you're going to get a lot more information from wandering around and joining seeing people their day-to-day lives and going to a palace or a market probably I mean well and also I think it's like we don't have to we don't have to choose one either absolutely like, again, one is not better than the yeah, other yeah yeah again and it's like to the the brain in the dark thing but I'm like it is all just color and light coming in at yeah. the end of the day. Like it's not inherently better or worse. Like your brain doesn't care. It's like, is it new? Are you interested in it? Like, you know, the converse of that is yeah. just like the droves and droves of people walking around the Louvre looking like they want to kill themselves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that winning? It. Like is it's cool? Is that what we want? I don't know, man. But maybe it is. Like I think you're right. It's so it's such a personal thing too. Like maybe if you had um, a particular interest in this part of history or this, I don't, I don't know, whatever the thing is that might be more interesting to you. And it would be worth the, like the weight and the droves of people or whatever, if that's yeah. something that you like, but if you don't like <laughs> it, there's no, yeah, there is no test at customs on your way home to see like how much of a, like a good traveler yeah. you were. Also, yeah, I think as well, like, it depends on the kind of travel because even while we're saying this, <laughs> like, like our anti-travel stance, it's like someone does the um, the review of the imposter syndrome club and it's just us being like, you should go all over the world and go to Starbucks. Yeah. <laughs> you know is, what? Just stay in the hotel pool. It's fine. Just stay in Australia, you guys. <laughs> no, that is absolutely not what we're saying. But no. I think that it's it's also knowing what the intention of that travel is. And it's like, yeah. quite honestly, if you are lucky enough, that's awesome to get sent across the world to do a job. It's fucking amazing. Absolutely. And cool. But but if that is what that trip is, then in, in a, that's kind yeah. of like any other work commute that you would do. And it's like yeah. a bonus if anything is happening on top there. It would be different to like if you had gone to travel with the, with the intention of travel to India and then not left your hotel office park for two weeks yeah. is a very different thing. Yeah. 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 But you, you're also within your rights to do that. It would be yeah. a, a lot more bleak if I had just <laughs> decided to do that. I would be calling <laughs> yeah. the cops on myself. Oh, wait. The, the, thing, the, thing that I, the thing that I wanted to say was um, I think that the the – the sort of other side to that argument that we're making about like, yeah, you do you, do whatever the fuck you want or don't. The other side of that is though also remembering that you only like what you know that you like. So sometimes there is 
Yeah, there is a lot of value in exposing yourself to a thing. And sometimes I think that is the the kind of other side of that is like the to-do list and you drag yourself to a thing that you kind of, you're feeling weirdly obliged to go. You don't really give a shit. But then you get there and you discover that you just didn't know how amazing it is and how interested you are. And like, yeah, you might discover a thing that moves you that, you know, that is kind of the whole point of travel. Yeah. But then to loop back, it's like you were not there to travel. You were there to work. Yeah. That's it. And I think it's, um, yeah, it's always that balance of knowing like what is actually like safe and looking after yourself and what is just like being a little bitch and and not taking that step because you don't want to. But then I think part of that as well is like recognising where like you are at personally and if you want resilience is through the fucking ground like it's been for me recently like that's not the time to go to something that would give you a panic attack at the best of times 100 100 (laughs) percent. that's not the time to push it oh I've just been reading this book um did you ever watch the movie The Martian yes so the author of The Martian Andy Weir wrote another book it's also like a kind of space sci-fi book called Project Hail Mary Mm. and it's Without going into the kind of um, actual, so it's it's fucking great. I've literally got I think like four pages to read when I get home. Oh. <laughs> Have you so been excited. saving it? It's so good. Yeah, I, I was like, oh. I wanted to like, oh, it's been so fun for the last week. I've just been out. I feel like this is so nerdy, but I've like been out, and it just in my mind, I'm like so excited to go home and read my book, which Whoa. I haven't had in so long. It's so fun and and it's awesome. Highly recommend. Um, but it's at some point there's, it's essentially like a human is having an interaction with an alien basically. Yeah. And it's just that it's such a interesting writing device because an alien is essentially like a way, I suppose the same thing in comedy of, of having someone to like straight man you except they're straight manning humanity. So it's like someone to just point out (laughs) the kind of craziness. Do you know what I mean? It's like the things that we think are normal, but you've just got someone to reflect that back in a kind of way that like defamiliarizes it and just shows you how weird it is. Yeah. But at some point the alien is just like learns that for humans, there's a thing called tired. There's a thing called sleep. And after a certain amount of hours, the the alien it'll be like you have to go to bed because you're stupid now like it's just it just watches the behavior and it's like after this point oh like you call it tired but like what I see is stupid you just become after 24 hours without the thing that you call sleep you become stupid you become an idiot yeah Yeah. and it's just like it's like oh yeah yeah like (laughs) yeah I also think of this is like, I promise I've not smoked any weed before doing this podcast, but it's very much in that realm of discussion. <laughs> this is our, but, like our dorm room stoner <laughs> totally. episode. <laughs> We're just all fucking connected, man. Um, but we when you think, though. when I think about, yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> Think about sleep and dreaming too much. I have to stop thinking about it because it is so fucking wild that firstly, like we don't 100% know why we sleep. Like it's never been proven. And we, we know that we need it and we die without it. We don't know its exact function. And we close our eyes for like eight hours a night and go somewhere else <laughs> In our imaginations and then come back into our bodies and wake up and go about our days and we're like, this is just normal. That's just fine. It's this a- is just a fine yeah. thing that we go and have these like <laughs> adventures, we kill people, we love people, we like, or sometimes it's just like mundane shit, but we go to this other world mm. and then we're just like, that's normal. Yeah. You know what I mean? I totally, also it's like we're like, we're getting so excited about VR. We're like, it's so crazy. You could put these like glasses on and like, whoa, be in this other world and it's real, but it's not real. And you're then, you know, and you're like, yeah, that happens nightly. Yeah, yeah. I do that all the time. Also like by myself. I'm like, that's the thing that is so crazy to me is like the Alice that I think I am. And I know this is fully stoner talk now, but I'm I'm like, Alice is not even, I'm like, oh, I... I'm not writing those stories, but they are, they're coming from but my brain though, yeah, right? So I'm like, I know. Which, who, what? That's, wait, are we still? <laughs> <laughs> we find out that it's just like been leaking through the bed. <laughs> I'm here for it. I love it. I think about that too, because it's hard not to like, 
I don't know if you growing up as a teenager or whatever had like dream books where it would tell you like what different things symbolise yeah. or meant or whatever. Um, but it's hard not to like ju- judge yourself for your dreams, which obviously you like <laughs> like cognitively have no control over. But like sometimes you're like, whoa, that was fucked. And I did that you're like to myself. Am I the bad guy? Yeah. <laughs> but do you, do you think that sometimes like, I don't know, I've had multiple dreams where I've like, killed someone or like does something really awful, but it almost feels like it's potentially a way of your brain putting you through a scenario and letting you feel what it would feel like so that you know not to do yeah. that in real life. A hundred. So yes. And a few things. I know so many friends who've spoken to me about, and this has happened like more than a few people who have had dreams about killing someone that they are like only 90% sure aren't real. Like that there's like at least a tiny part of them that's like a bit scared that maybe oh, that they, they did. did yeah. And it's like a I've repressed that ex- memory. Yes, I've had exactly yes. that experience. And I thought, yeah. Yeah. And everyone like doesn't say because they're like, holy, like, but what if it's real? And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, wait a second though, because I've heard someone else that like it's a thing. There's a co- How crazy. I've not. I don't think I've spoken to anyone else about that other than Dan. He gets to hear all of my murder <laughs> stories. Um, but yeah, how you know, that makes me feel um, heaps better, yeah. actually. <laughs> I really think it is just, yeah, I, I don't know. I think, like, I think there is, there's also a thing that I notice with myself where my brain sometimes equalizes. Like it, it equalizes other extreme emotions. So there've been times in my life where I'm at my happiest is usually when I'll have the most nightmares. I think really? just, yeah. And I think That's it's just that my brain is just like, feels like it needs to offset that karmic debt somehow. It's just like, it's like, don't get too much there. We're just gonna like average it out. Yeah. at night so that the scales don't tip. I don't, I don't know. Wow. That's fascinating. Yeah. It's weird. I think I can't remember. Oh, we're not like we're not having a no, podcast we're not doing talking it. about no. dreams. But <laughs> famously, I can't, um, what people <laughs> want to listen to. <laughs> but I can't even remember having a dream recently, which is really? interesting. Yeah, I dream I, every night. Well, I usually do. Maybe not every night, but but often. Um, but yeah, I wonder if like intense stress or whatever that brain and body is just like give her a break <laughs> we'll just let her like be in darkness <laughs> is she so when you say recently do you mean like uh, over this last patch of just like the, yeah I just can't the, remember the, like I can't pull to mind times. yeah a dream that wow. I've had recently where usually I would be able to yeah wow yeah but it, I mean the the theory is that you you always dream it just depends on where you are in the sleep yeah. cycle when you wake up if you remember Dreaming or not, is that yeah. right? That's what I've heard. I've also heard like very, very recently that there's a new, they released a new study where they actually think that they, well, some scientists have argued that they've kind of worked out why they think we dream. Oh, and wow. it's essentially like they've done these tests on, it's like to do with neuroplasticity and basically like how if someone loses their vision, they'll get, it. their other senses heighten, right? So like, uh-huh. To, which makes sense to to compensate, but because your brain is so plastic and so good at making that transition, it happens like very quickly. So you're almost on an, a 90 minute loop where your visual system needs to reassert itself so that it doesn't get hijacked by your other senses. Oh, so it's wow. like keeping it. It's, it's almost like not quite a screensaver, but it's like, if your visual system is like unused, for 10 hours, completely unused, that it's going to, those resources start getting diverted to other senses, which wow. we, which it doesn't want. So it's got to just like fire it up again. And then obviously the, there's a different part of us that, that assigns narrative and then kind of like makes meaning from that. But it literally just is like, it's like blasting visual information so that that isn't, so that it's used. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. I just yeah, did like I a no very idea. layman's, I'll find, um, I think it was Eagleman. Wow. I'll find the the reference. 
huh. to the interview. It was so interesting. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I want it to be something more like we're going to a different, <laughs> a parallel universe. It makes sense, or that, but it's like less, you know, profound. Yeah. Or it's like less. I kind of, I think there was part of me that wants there to be like a psycho emotional reason. Totally. Like, oh, yeah, we're yeah. doing spring cleaning cognitively. We're working out issues. We're processing. Yeah. And resolved emotion. And I suppose it is, that for me feels more like romantic, I suppose, in some way. And, and like, this feels but very pragmatic. Be, yeah. But I mean, is there, there's a world in which it can be both of those yeah. things because like, yeah, cool. But it's not like you're just seeing like colors and patterns like, a, like you would on an actual screensaver. Yeah, that is true. Like there is still content to That's it. That's true. And so there may or may not, I suppose, yeah. be a reason. I mean, there would be a reason whether it's just like depends on things that you saw through, through the day that maybe, you know, are, are hidden away in pockets that you don't consciously get to see, but they're sort of sorting themselves out at night or the whatever. The giant spiders that you saw during the day but didn't, <laughs> <laughs> didn't notice you were seeing. Yes, yeah. <laughs> the murder yeah. that I committed at lunchtime <laughs> just tucked away somewhere back there. <laughs> um, I really have to blow my nose. I'm sorry. It's gotten to a point where I've been breathing through my mouth, mm, feeling like a little <sighs> feeling a like little a monster, like a programmer. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> feeling like an AB guy. Yeah. Wow. Shots fired. <gasps> AB guys are the best. Yeah. No yeah. shade. No. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> Just. But, or, but maybe it's my um, graduation, all of the plugging in of chords I've been doing over the last year. You know, I've uh, I've earned my, oh, your my AV credibility. Stripes. No, I love an AV. There we go. No, yeah. wait. Just do. <laughs> Is it, Keep we, talking, <laughs> Alice. No, no, I'm going to listen to me blowing you. my nose. I'm just watching you. <laughs> Is there a... Do we have the power to make this go away? <laughs> Can you use your AV guy skills? <laughs> <laughs> oh, girl. Uh, All right. No, we're good. We're good. So what I wanted to say was I had this beautiful moment last night. I had a really, really shitty day yesterday, but I got home and it was the best because Tom was there. He ordered Indian food on Uber Eats. No more oh, Indian no. food. <laughs> Trigger. <laughs> <laughs> he ordered an amazing takeaway. It was so delicious. Um, and it's a, I, it's a week that we have Maggie. But Maggie is my spoodle who I share joint custody with my ex-husband. <laughs> <laughs> you know, normal, normal adult today. So it was, <laughs> I've got Maggie. So I was sitting on the couch. We were watching Lego Masters, which is truly the most amazing, wholesome, gorgeous yeah. thing. Eating takeaways, Tom's cuddling me on one side, Maggie's cuddling me on the other side. It was like, it was perfect. I, was, I literally was like, there is no, I can objectively and I will stake everything I own on it. There was no one happier in Melbourne. I was just like, this Aww. is heaven. And then Maggie starts dreaming and she's like lying there and she's doing the little dog dream thing of like her paws are twitching yeah. and then her mouth starts twitching and she does little growls. And it's so cute because she barely ever growls in real life like it's a very unfamiliar sound but she's lying there twitching and growling and I just it, it's that thought of I think if you know how those hypothetical questions of like if you could have one wish what would that wish be I think mine would be just like to know what a dog dream is like like what is that experience for her is she seeing is it just is she feeling just the feeling of like wanting to, of like being threatened and, and she's fighting that. Is she seeing another dog? Like, is there a picture of another dog? Is it just the smell of another dog? Like, what is that? Weirdly enough, I read an article about this <laughs> recently. <laughs> is it about weird or is it the dreams. most predictable thing you could have <laughs> responded? <laughs> In that they, and I, I don't know what evidence they're basing this on, but they have reason to believe that dogs dream mostly about their owners. <laughs> so she's probably dreaming about you. Well, why was she dro- why <clears throat> was she growling? Well, you did something awful. You probably committed some murders. <laughs> I just I was out murdering again. <laughs> you were doing your murdery thing. Oh. Um because you're because you're like the whole world, right? Like I mean, you know, obviously yeah, you take them places pack. and take them to a dog park and whatever, they'll play with other dogs, but 
you are like, you're everything to them. I suppose I'm consistent to them. The other yeah. dogs they encounter are not like yeah. consistent fixtures. Yeah. So yeah, I'll try, I'll try and find this article that I happened across because I can't remember any of the detail other than that, which, because obviously I went, oh, they're dreaming about me. I know, but it's not, yeah. it's just also like, I want to know though, like, what is it? What it looks look like. like. But or what does the world like? look like yeah. through their eyes? I wonder that all the time. Like, what do they actually yeah. see and how do they interpret things? Like our... <laughs> Our dogs are tiny. They're like smaller than most cats. Got a Chihuahua and a Chihuahua Papillon cross. And I think all the time that like firstly just like being that size like on the couch with these two big like monkey humans must be so fun because they just have this huge like imagine the same ratio me on a couch that big. Yeah, it's like someone's head is the size of your whole body. Yeah. And yeah, they love you. Right. But because like these dogs have obviously only been given like love and adoration for their whole lives. We've had them both since puppies. They're just like, like Pickle will come and just like flop backwards on you all the time. That's that's her move. It's just like falling backwards <laughs> with a little belly up in yeah. the air. And it's like, you are so vulnerable, but you feel because you've all you've been filled with your whole life is love. And yeah. luckily, you know, we haven't had any terrible situations with either dogs other than um, we got people during lockdown so she didn't get to get all that well socialised. So she's a little barky <laughs> at other dogs. But for the most part, like, they haven't had a traumatic event. Yeah. That they're just, like, they're just set to love. Like, they just have yeah. their dial set to love and safety all the time and have no reason to believe that yeah. treat, people are going to treat them with anything else than love and yeah. kindness and that they're safe to expose their soft little bellies. You know, I just yeah. think like it would, I want to know what it sort of looks like and feels like through those eyes, you know, you know I what I mean, t- where I the world tot- feels safe. Yeah, I totally, and I think that it is, I think it's like a maybe an unspoken or unrecognized part of why as humans we love having dogs is just, Because I'll often think about how it feels like such a privilege to me to have a creature who it is within my control mostly to make her life only one of love. Yeah. And that feels amazing. I mean, I'm sure that there's a million academic papers written on like the other psychological bullshit and power and blah, 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 like, and fully, yes, that, that can all be true at the same time, like. But, but it just is amazing. I, yeah, I get that feeling of like, hey, your world is love. That trust, like to walk up to every stranger with this big open heart and assume love. Like I often think that with Maggie. She's like my life coach. I'm like, she totally. walks into the room like everyone already loves her. Yeah. Not out of arrogance, but just out of like existing is a good enough reason to be loved. And that's yeah. fine. Like it's not like yeah. a psychotic, like, um, what's the word with an N? Narcissistic. It's not like a yeah. narcissistic thing. It's just like a, hey, I'm here. Hey, hey guys, I'm Maggie. I'm here, I'm yeah. here. I'm like, yeah, that's a that is a great way to, to show up. And I think it must be incredibly, like for parents of, of like human children where you can't control that, right? Like you can yeah. do your best and you send them off to school and know that they're going to come home one day with like, with tears, not from falling down, but like from something that another human child who is just trying to live their own life has like hurt them. And you can, I'm sure parents like watch changes happen. Like they watch that instead of coming and flopping down with their belly to the sky with that trust. And and of course you have to learn how to to protect yourself as well, but it must be very difficult to watch that happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is why one of the many reasons I feel like dogs are far superior to <laughs> human children. That's cool. That's not a uh, that's not a polarizing <laughs> position. It's also frowned upon to leave human children unattended for periods of time. Some, I understand. Just so. tie your baby up outside the IGA. <laughs> No, human babies are pretty great too. Both have their pros and cons. Yeah, that's okay. what we're <laughs> Nuance. That's what this podcast is about. We can we can feel lots of opposing things at the same time. Yeah. It's been like through this, you know, this 
tricky time <laughs> last month or so, the dogs have been incredibly important <laughs> to, therapy to me. Dogs. They just like, it really does feel like they know when to turn it up when you're particularly in need. Yeah. Um, also like for them, me not being able to do anything, but just like lie in bed or on the couch for a day is like their dream. <laughs> That's their dream day. <laughs> like, so, you know, finally. silver linings. <laughs> <laughs> they must have such a positive association with like snot basically. They're like, oh, when the, like, when the yeah, snot probably. sounds come, they're like, yes. Yes. This is my yes. time to shine. <laughs> but there's something that just feels like, you know, like they love you so much regardless of like, they're not, they're never going to judge you, Yeah, I guess. Not that anyone else is, but when you're feeling that like sensitive and vulnerable, it feels like, yeah, the whole world is out to attack you. And then you've got these two little things that just want to they just want to be near yeah. you just cause. Yeah. Packs. Like, you know? Cause you're their pack. Yeah. I also had a really nice, you know, that specific feeling when um, a dog comes up to you and wants to hang out with you and you're like, maybe I'm okay. <laughs> you chose maybe me. Maybe I am an all right human being. <laughs> I was at a workshop on um, Friday um, and I was feeling a little like, it was, you know, you can hear in my voice, I've still got symptoms. I feel quite a lot better, but I've still, you know, had like a pretty nasty cough and snotty and stuff. But um, I, I checked with them. I'm like, it's been like a week that I've been sick. I've still got these symptoms. I feel like I will feel well enough, but it's just like up to you guys yeah. whether you feel comfortable and they were, they were happy to go ahead. Um, anyway, one of the, uh, and this is a group of participants, participants, a group of people, clients that I've been working with for, for a long time and, and know them quite well. They're a beautiful group of people. Um, and uh, one of the people there like halfway through was like, oh, I better go check on the dogs. I'm like, what do- dog? Sorry, where are the, where are the dogs? Dogs? Doggies? Yeah, wait, what? Doggies? Um, which she might, they must have been in a car or something, I suppose. I don't know. I think she lives regionally. Um, I'm sure whatever she was doing was safe <laughs> and fine by the dogs. I, I don't know. But I was like, can we not just bring, can we bring the dogs? In to the, so it was like it was in like a you know an office in the mm. city but there was like the floor we were on there wasn't really many other people around and it was just us in this room like you could definitely just bring them up the goods lift like yeah. no one is going to notice um and she did and my like I could feel like something lighten inside me but just yeah. like the presence of dogs and everyone else there too like it just sort of it lifts something in people that just makes you feel, it just makes you feel good. Yeah. And so like the work continues, but I've got like a little doggy on each side that's just, <gasps> it's you so know, good. just yeah. makes everything a little bit more joyful. I think it reminds us also that we're animals, like especially in a work context where everyone's wearing their work clothes and like kind of dehumanizing themselves and de-animalizing themselves mm. and, and acting like this myth of what we think is supposed to be professional. And then you just bring in these little forces that don't recognize any of those hierarchies yeah. whatsoever. And it just, it's that exact expansion of perspective that you need. We can like, okay, cool. Like someone might be someone's boss, superior, whatever you want to call it in, in that particular context, but it's not it's not like a fundamental truth. Like it's a made yeah. up thing. Yeah, it's yeah, not, yeah, that's it. And if, and if like there are, I was going to say people, but uh, creatures or someone who doesn't recognize that, doesn't doesn't have that same cultural capital. Yeah. It immediately just like kind of reveals that as the construct that it is. That's a really good point actually because it's not like you could try to explain to your dog <laughs> for as long as you wanted yeah. like how important someone was yeah. or how senior their role is and it doesn't matter how many different ways you say that, a dog is never going no. to understand it. You're like, no, 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 <laughs> Kevin's the CEO. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should start a uh, a movement for um, pets in all meetings, just to like. Oh my god, us. I want that. I have this dream of this thing when I'm pre- when I'm president. What I would do, <laughs> president of what? I thought, I thought just you know things. Stuff. <laughs> well, I've thought about this a lot. I'm like, it's a day, right? This is my dream, Jessamy. This is what yeah. this is what I want to achieve with my life. It's just a day, one day, where. The whole city stops and all the humans have to stay inside. So there's no cars, there's no trams, there's like nothing moving. 
but all the dogs are released into the city. <laughs> and you just have a day where like they can all walk around as they wish down the streets, visiting each other, seeing things, smelling things. Like, I don't know how you eventually get them back into their homes, but I just love the idea of like the whole of like Melbourne, but just only dogs, just dogs on the streets, dogs walking around, dogs going into the shops. Like that's it. That's my dream. To the end. You are adorable. <laughs> so I mean, look, I'm not going to start poking logistical no, holes in you your dream. Dare. So we'll just. <laughs> That's what I want. <coughs> the hot ones with the hot ones. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, my heart really wants to pee. <laughs> I fucking knew you were going to say that. I'm so sorry. For like the last half an hour, I've been like, can I. Pause it, but we're probably close to winding up anyway. We're gonna when we when we hit the big time, <laughs> we're just gonna we're just gonna install gonna our it studio. <laughs> in the, like, yeah, okay, that one's better. I was gonna say install our studio in the bathroom, <laughs> but but yeah, catheter. Yeah, we'll, we'll workshop it. We've yeah, got time. We'll workshop it. Yeah, or just yeah, get a seat with a hole in it. <laughs> <laughs> a toilet. That's what we got. <laughs> Maybe that's who we get sponsored by. Our first sponsor uh, could be some adult diaper company. <laughs> and we work our way up to some kind of plumbing sponsorship. <laughs> Dream big, girl. Dream that's, big. Thank you for this um, ridiculous conversation. Oh, I love you very much. Pleasure. I love um, you very much. Hey, before we go as well, we now have a um, Patreon if anyone has, you know, the interest, the want to support us, its um, that would be awesome. If you don't have the means, that's also, of course, totally fine. But you can always, um, you know, tell a friend, give us a five-star yeah. review, um, share it with someone. That's also extremely, extremely helpful. But I did want to say uh, a huge special thanks to Eliza Sikulis, also previous guest of the Imposter Syndrome Club, and Kaina Tierney for being our first two patrons on Patreon. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And I think yeah. that's always like being the first to do something, um, take some guts and some, you know, yeah, it's like joining a thing that there's already hundreds of people part of is one thing, but being the the first couple is, well, it's certainly very special to us yeah. and it makes us feel, um, great that someone, you know, believes in us. So if you'd like to join them on there, there's um, going to be extra little bits of content. There's a voice note currently up there for me when I was in India um, <laughs> complaining about stuff. So <laughs> if you want some of that grade A content, see exactly where, I don't remember what it says, which is cool. Um, <laughs> but if you want to see a woman on the edge, um, sign up to our Patreon yeah. and that's waiting there for yeah. yeah. Thank you, Eliza. And thank you, Kina. So fucking cool. And yeah, thanks to everyone who came to our live show. It was oh, yeah. so fucking fun. Oh my God. It was, it was so fun. Like even amidst like that crazy week with everything going on, it was just, yeah, it was so joyful. If you haven't listened to that, um, episode that, which is last week's episode as well, it's, um, <laughs> I was like, okay, it's actually really good. I don't mean to sound surprised. <laughs> surprised Say it without the actually. By the, but, you know, I think um, in a different way to when we do this and it's just us, like there is an element of like you listen back to it and you're like, huh, oh, that's what we talked about. But that was elevated significantly there, I think, just because there was like managing like moving parts and multiple guests and there's an audience there. So literally and being very tired when – the event finished, I was like, I have no idea what we yeah. just spoke about for the last hour. So when I say actually really good, it's not that I'm surprised that it's good. It's that I had no memory yeah. really of what happened. It totally <laughs> makes sense. It totally makes sense. And yeah, it was that event, I think, over delivered in every single way. And we were, both of us afterwards just kept looking at each other. We were like, what the fuck? Yeah. Yeah. So it was yeah. so thank great. Thank you. You, thank you, everyone who was there. And yeah. Thank you for listening. Thanks for yeah. coming on this um wild ride with us. Yeah. Next time, hopefully I'll be um snot free and uh a better person. <laughs> <laughs> at least one of those things. <laughs> Goodbye. Okay, love you. Bye. Bye. 
thank you for listening to the Imposter Syndrome Club. Please follow us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're feeling extra kind, rate and review. Or if you got any insights or value from this, share with a friend. You can also find us on Instagram at ImpostorPod or online at ImpostorSyndromeClub.com.